Sir Patrick, how are you? I'm uh, I'm okay. I've um, I did a ninety minute fresh air interview yesterday, and I talked too much, so that's why I'm talking like this now because my voice got very tired. So I'm trying I thought to you were just this. doing an impression of my character from The Witcher. It it was that as well. Yes, I, you know, you can hear you know the the kind of modest respect in my voice now. I thought it was more effective than me yelling at you like I did a couple of days ago. That's, that's exactly what I did with the character. You're, you're exactly right. Yeah. Sir Patrick, we met many, many years ago. I believe it was in 2003. Uh, you were casting for The Lion in Winter, and I had been acting for three years at that stage. I had my first job, which was The Count of Monte Cristo, when I was 17 years old. I, was, uh, I left school one year early and I was incredibly nervous to audition in front of, of an actor of your caliber. And I went into the audition, I, I had spent weeks learning my lines and by the time I got in there, I had whipped myself into such a frenzy that I completely flubbed the audition. I didn't remember my lines, I forgot how to act and then I, I left with my tail in between my legs and called my agent immediately afterwards. You were very gracious. You said, thank you very much. And uh, it, was, it was clear to me that I was not going to be getting this role. Uh, so I called my agent and told my agent as much. And they said, don't worry about it. It's okay. Uh, you will, um, th there'll be other auditions. It, this, you're not going to get everyone. You're not going to nail everyone. And as I was walking down a, a street in London, I forget which one it was, I suddenly thought, I'm not going to walk away from a, an audition with Sir Patrick Stewart and have it be a bad one. I'm going to at least try to get back in there because I know I can do better. And so I went back in and uh, well, my agent arranged for me to come back in. Uh, you said it was okay. And then I did another audition, which went far better. It wasn't good enough to get the job, but it was far better. And, and you you gave me very, very kind words and you said, I'm so glad that you came back in. And that gave me such strength throughout my career and I've never forgotten it because it's, I tend to find as an actor, we can judge ourselves incredibly harshly if we get it wrong. And I feel like um, acting is, is a skill which doesn't always appear when you reach into that, that abyss, hoping that you can clutch it and, and pull it out. <laughs> And um, on that day, I did not. And then I came back in and I managed to find some space. And you were very, very gracious. And you let me know that I did the right thing. And that meant a lot to me. So uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Oh, Henry, that's a delightful story. Um, I, I think it, it probably says more about me as a producer than it does about you as an actor. Um, I, I was... Uh, Glenn Close and I were playing the leading roles in, in Lion in Winter, but I was, my company were also producing it too. And um, I was continually finding myself in situations that were unfamiliar to me. And auditioning was one of them. Um, I'd had some bad audition experiences in my career. I mean, okay. directors who took telephone calls while I was actually doing my audition. Actually, that happened to me twice. Um, and the second time, the director said, yeah, yeah, just go on. He's fine, fine, just go on. Yeah, 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 I know what I when, when <laughs> Yeah, I'm never hiring this um, guy, not this guy, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I always, uh, when, I, when I was in the auditioning spot, the audition, uh, I always try to be as welcoming and relaxed and as easygoing as possible. Because the, the one thing I learned about sitting behind the table, have you produced or directed, Henry? I have not produced nor directed. Um, producing is something which I have my eye on and, and I've started to get the itch for directing. I, I've got a lot to learn, but I haven't done anything yet. Well, what I discovered, I, I started sitting in on auditions when we were filming Star Trek The Next Generation. And first of all, I was shocked by how 
brusque and offhand my fellow producers and directors were with actors who came in. And I would always make a point of getting up from behind the table, meeting them as they came into the room, shaking hands with them, asking them how they were, a few questions, and then sitting down. Until my fellow producer said to me, will you stop doing that? You don't have to make friends with these people. And I said, but all I'm trying to do is relax them, you know, make them, make them feel easier. But the one thing that I learned, which I tell young actors, if I'm, you know, doing a, a, a masterclass or whatever, you must realize that when you audition, the people who are doing the auditioning and watching you, they want you to be the best actor that ever walks in the right. world. That's what we're hungry for. We don't want yeah. another disappointment. We want something that will blow us away. So I say, you've already got a head start. They're happy you're in their room. They want you to do remarkably well. Just, you know. Hold on to that. And then the other thing about auditions I've always find is as soon as you've done them, erase them. Because the chances are you won't get the job and you'll just fret about it and be sad. But I thought it shows great balls that you came back a second time. <laughs> Thanks for that story. Yeah, whether whether it was for better or for worse, it was uh, it definitely it was it was a good moment. It was a good moment. And normally I would just forget, but I had grown up watching you with my father um, on The Next Generation. So it was, it was something which I really, really wanted to do well in. And I thought, mm -mm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna accept that as, as his lasting impression of me. And, uh, and I'm glad I came back as well. Oh, well, yes. Well, I am only glad to be sitting face to face with you. Although face to face, thanks to technology, not in real life. Where are you, by the way, Henry? I am in the UK. I'm um, in just near Reading. There's a there's a studio here which um, I'm I'm nearby and I'm using it because it has a better Wi-Fi um, than my home or the home I'm staying in. Yeah. Well, um, welcome to Los Angeles. Thank you very much. much. We, are, right? we are in lockdown here in in LA. Um, I wanted to ask you something. I, I know that you have, um, a, as we would say, a public school, or here they would say a private school education. And do you have any sense at all what impact that kind of education had on your ambition to act and, your, the, and the way you acted? And what, I assume that you were acting on the stage to begin with. Was there any impact? Because I had no education at all. I'm, I'm an ignorant son of a bitch. And, and I, I, I've always been curious about someone like you. Um, I, I, think, I think it did actually um, have, have a, a fairly serious impact. Uh, I consider myself incredibly fortunate to have gone to a school like uh, Stowe School, which is the, the school I went to. Uh, they had a really good acting department. And I, they do I was, really. They, they did, yes. I mean, I don't know if they still do, if it's gotten even better than it was. But there was a full theatre in the school, um, and there was a a very small theatre as well for um, house productions, boarding house productions. Um, we had house plays every year. We had uh, a senior play and a junior play as well. And um, I, of course, I when I went when I was in boarding school and. Even now, actually, just not a very cool person, and I I didn't have uh, a a very uh, successful time socially at school, and so acting was a wonderful, wonderful outlet for me. Um, I could, it was all as children. I think a lot of us have that that sense of um, uh, trying to discover who our person, who we are as personalities, and I was struggling with that. Because uh, my, my who, what my personality was 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 not um, was not considered cool or popular or whatever was 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 down at that time, and so I got to be whoever the character was on stage, and I couldn't be criticised for that. Um, ironically, because all we live by is critics now, but um, I couldn't be criticised for the character I was because I was playing a character from um, from a, from a playbook, and so it it 
just was a wonderful outlet for me and I really, really enjoyed it. I consider myself incredibly fortunate and they were always very supportive. There was two casting groups came around uh, my boarding school when I was young. Uh, one for I Dream of Africa, I think it was I Dream of Africa, uh, with Kim Bassinger and I got shortlisted for that, didn't get that role. And then the second one was for the Count of Monte Cristo, which I did get. And then I left school one year early to go do that. And so the, that education, the education which really helped, the part of which really helped, I find, was the, the boarding school element. Because when you get thrown out into the big wide world, and especially in the acting world, you have to accept knockbacks an awful lot. And everything feels like a judgment of your ability and character. And having been in boarding school, having been separated from my parents um, for a while and used to it, by the time I was out there and acting and looking for jobs in LA and London, it was, no, wasn't so bad. I, I was okay with it. And I wasn't suffering from homesickness at that stage. It wasn't a distraction. It was, it was actually enormously beneficial to have gone through the boarding school experience. Henry, am I right in thinking from what I just heard you say that you felt comfortable becoming somebody else and for a short period of time not being Henry Cavill but being whoever you were playing. Is that what you were saying? And that is absolutely correct, yes. Uh, well, it's extraordinary. I, uh, maybe we should do huge research with equity because that was totally my experience. The, the, the biggest attraction to me to begin, well, two attractions. One was that I was no longer Patrick Stewart, who I didn't think was up to much. And the other thing was, because my home life could be a little bit scary at times, I, I felt safer on a stage being someone else than anywhere else in my life at that time. And I, it, would be, it would be great to know if this was another experience that actors had at the very beginning that made the theatre so appealing. Uh, people who are not actors say to me, I don't know how you do it. You walk out onto that brightly lit stage and there are 1,500 people all there sitting in silence waiting to hear what you're going to say and do. And I, I couldn't do that. But you and I do that. And whew, it feels so good to be there. Am I right? It, you are absolutely right. It, it's, it's actually, you, you've put it perfectly. That's exactly, it's exactly how I felt in school on stage and exactly how I feel when the cameras are rolling on set. It's, uh, it's an interesting insight to the, the psyches of, of actors, the escapism from ourselves. Hmm. <laughs> uh, so, you, so you were acting in school? Or I was did, it yeah. you... I, when I was 17, I went to the Bristol Olympic School. And um, that was where my life really began because to be surrounded by other people of my age, I was Robin Phillips, the may he rest in peace, the director, and I were the two youngest people in my year. Um, but to be every day surrounded by people who felt like me, who wanted to do what I did, because I would, I, I had been thought of as being a bit weird where I was growing up because I wanted to act. And, and to them, to, to the, my friends, it was just, I was a show off and that was all. And it wasn't true, there were right. other reasons. But then to find a whole community and society of people who felt just like me. And I think it's one of the reasons why what I, I, I've come to love companies so much, whether it's on stage or like doing a show like Picard or Next Generation. We were a company. Um, I, I continually insisted that we should think of ourselves as an ensemble and that there wasn't Jean-Luc Picard sitting in the captain's chair, but we were a group who were all united in doing one thing. You know? And uh, does, that, does that make sense to you? It absolutely does make sense. It's, um, I, it's something which I'm uh, beginning to experience more and more these days. I, I don't have a, a big theatre background. I did a little bit of theatre in school before going into the big wide world and acting professionally. And 
I, I haven't really been part of companies before. Um, I mean, I've been part of uh, casts and crews on films, but it's there, there's a different kind of connection there. It's it's often only the people who you're doing scenes with that you can really build a connection with. Yes, and yes. I found the older I've gotten, it's I want to get more involved with everyone else, given the time, of course. I mean, TV is, is, is very quick these days and, and schedules are very tight. Um, but it's I do like the idea of, of the companies. I mean, I, I come from a, fam a big family, and so large groups of people are, are something which I... I gravitate towards and so yeah. I, I do definitely feel that and it's something which I'm embracing a lot more uh, the more experience I get and, and the less I, I have panic when I'm on set and, and more about enjoy this experience because it's it's a wonderful dream job and and it's exciting to act rather don't be terrified of it like go on there smiling and, and love every second now you've done one season of the witches is that right uh, yes, one season of The Witcher, and uh, we have, we just started season two before lockdown happened, and we're we're hopefully going to go oh, back soon. Right, right, because that will hopefully strengthen that feeling more and more as you get into a second season and maybe a third or a fourth. You know. Wow, wow, wow! What, what is what is that? It's a wizard seal. The gin. Do you mind if I? Yes, you. Take back that bit about my fillingless pie. Take it back, and then you can have your ginny gin gin. Let go. No, no, let go, you horses! Ah! With, with Next Generation, which I, I watched growing up, uh, I was watching an interview recently, and you had said that initially, when you joined the cast, uh, everyone was doing a lot of uh, joking around on set, and there was a lot of good times, and you were, were a lot more serious, and it was a lot more of a sense of of um, no, we've got to take this seriously. And then throughout uh, the series, as the show went on, you actually uh, opened up a bit more to the idea of, of it actually being really good fun. And I, do you, did you try and bring some of that to Picard, uh, to Star Trek Picard? Um, because I see a lot more in the way of, of warmth in the character and, and, and lightness in the character. Um. Yes, uh, it, uh, I'm not a writer. So although I was allowed as, as a co-executive producer, I was allowed into the writer's room, but I would just sit there with my mouth open, listening to these great ideas that would flash backwards and forwards across the table and then be thrown out of the window. And I want to go, no, 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 that was <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> I loved being in that room. I, I wish that I could have recorded every moment that I, I sat with our writers, um, but I, the only things I think that I actually contributed in terms of dialogue were jokes. Like okay. we, had a, we had a piece about um, one of the other characters is reading a very famous, I think an Asimov book, a science fiction book. And Jean Le Picard, I, I said, you know, I, I I could never really get into science fiction. It didn't, didn't mean anything to me. To have Captain Picard talking about science fiction as though it was an alien concept was something which right. I really enjoyed. And uh, T. Earl Grey decaf was my idea as well, because I thought, <laughs> I thought it was time to have some jokes with the character, um, because there was a lot of grimness surrounding him yes. otherwise. And I was very reluctant very reluctant to go back to that franchise. But every day, my satisfaction and pleasure and fun grew and grew and grew. And I am, I am so glad that they came up with the idea, Alex Kurtzman and my, my fellow producers, and that it was, and they cast the group that they have because we have a brilliant cast with us. It's, um, and, and the, the story is going somewhere else and it's affecting mm -hmm. all the characters very differently. So there's an unexpected quality about it all the time. But like you, we're just waiting to begin our second season. I need a secure subspace link to Starfleet Command. What? what? 
And what's the nearest starbase? Uh, deep Space 12. Lay in a course. And so coming back as, as a producer on, on a Star Trek show, what, what were the differences uh, coming back as a producer, aside from having the luxury of sitting in the writer's room? Uh, what, were the, what were the differences as opposed to just being one of the ensemble actors? Um, having a hand in directing where the narrative would go and being able to contribute personal private feelings about the character, about Jean-Luc Picard, um, which would also influence the direction of the narrative. Um, of course, I was also involved in casting too, which, um, okay. which, which, which I enjoyed very, very much. And although it became very difficult because, you know, you, you, you see so many, I mean, with young actors today, there is so much talent around, extraordinary talent. Yeah. And it was thrilling. I didn't know, I had no personal connection with any of the actors who were cast in Picard, but um, auditioning them was exciting and working with them has been even more exciting. Uh, that Those are the main elements for me of being an executive producer. Also, I do get to hear about things a little bit sooner than the actors do. <laughs> right. You get to hear the, have the pages two days early rather than the night before. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Issa Briones was absolutely fantastic in the show. What was it like working with her? Because her, her performances were extraordinary. I, I, I thought she brought um, something incredible to the show, which, which really uh, worked so well with Picard. It, well, we, we had a, a good working relationship. Um, and of course, Issa, in that first season, actually played three roles, three yeah. different creatures um, yeah. who all look the same. Issa is the only member of our company that I asked if I could audition with. So when she came for her final callback, um, rather than having a casting director's assistant reading with her, uh, we did, I think we did two scenes together. And it made such a difference to me to be looking her in the eyes and, and responding to her and vice versa. Um, Issa came to us hot from Hamilton. She'd been, she was in the North American tour of Hamilton and she's a singer and, uh, oh, wow. and a wonderful voice she has too. Um, but for her, it was a transformation. Um, she came from the stage to a sound stage, from a musical to a science fiction drama. Um, and I, I think we were all a little cautious and a little uncomfortable maybe to begin with, but it very quickly dissipated and um, and the sense of of uh, uh, kind of fearless commitment to doing the job became uh, what everybody was contributing. Oh, she is remarkable. That's, that's, that's the, I think the she, was, she was maybe 19, perhaps just 20 when we auditioned her. Goodness me, that's a, <laughs> that's, that's a big step. That's a big step at that yeah. age. Uh, and the same goes for Evan Evagoria, the Australian actor who plays, yes. well, he didn't play the little boy, but he grows up to be a man and is brought up with warrior nuns. Um, yes. Uh, he had had very, very little experience and it has been marvelous working with Evan to see his confidence grow and his risk taking grow. Um, it's, I actually do at times feel like a father figure um, because they're all so much younger than me and, uh, and I am enjoying their contribution enormously. You said you'd take me home. Yes, and I will, but we face a powerful enemy. We can't do it without support. Look, 
you have no choice but to trust me. I, I know that would make me angry too, but I understand. So for you, with, with Picard, was there anything that you wanted to bring to this character which was going to differ particularly from Next Generation? What, what, were, your, what were your goals for the character, for the, the evolution of the character? Um, I'll try and keep this as, as short as possible, Henry. Um, <laughs> Uh, during the seven years that we filmed Next Generation series and the four feature films that followed it, yeah. um, uh, without intending to, Picard came closer and closer and closer to me, to Patrick, so that after a while, there was no place that I could identify where Jean-Luc left off and Patrick Stewart began. They, they became one. So I, I didn't have to sit and brood about, you know, what kind of breakfast I'd had that morning as my character before I went on the set. There was so much already at work within me. Um, what I did want, and I, to the writers, I cited the movie Logan that I, I did um, with Hugh Jackman, the last of the X-Men movies, <clears throat> yeah. uh, where, uh, that last movie, Logan, found the two of us in conditions that were totally unlike anything that we'd experienced yeah. before. And it was uh, thrilling for both of us because we were continually being challenged in very different mm -hmm. ways. So I said to our, my fellow producers, I would like the same thing. I don't want you to rewrite Logan for me. No, no. Right. But the, the contrast between the Picard that I had been in Next Generation and, the, and the, how the 17, 18 years that had passed had changed and affected him. He was now angry, moody, uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, guilty, sad, lonely, all of those things which he had never been before. So without changing the most internal part of the man, he had to be different. His responses to the world were different from what the next generation's genre could be. And you will understand how much fun that was. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you, you almost described my character then when um, you were saying angry, sad, lonely. It's, it's all of these things that, that Geralt of Rivia uh, tends to be and it was it was one of those challenges to play the character in such a way that all of these things came through but they didn't dominate the character entirely so you end up with some, someone who is wholly unlikable. I, I, I'm, I'm reading um, Kirk Douglas's autobiography at the moment, um, nearly finished it and at one point in that he said um, that he was given a great piece of advice by Laurence Olivier, that no matter what kind of character you are playing, there must always be one little element, and it can be tiny, which makes that character likable. Okay. And I, I saw it in Olivier's stage performances and some of his screen performances too. Um, and certainly with Kirk Douglas, I could see it. Um, that there was, there was a, a, an empathic reaction that one had to them, even in the worst possible conditions. And it was because there was, there was this element of likability, I found. Does that make sense? It, it really does make sense, absolutely. And it, it's something which uh, I, 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 I wanted to give the character, uh, especially in, in the show, was an essence of a likability or, or connection, uh, an audience connection, because we had in, in the books, which, which the character comes from, there's the luxury of lots of inner monologue and long, complex, nuanced dialogue scenes with other characters. And so despite the exterior of this character or uh, despite the front he presents and some of the acts he commits, you get an insight to who he is, you get an insight to his philosophies, his beliefs, and, and the way he views the world. But because 
the showrunner's vision for this show was uh, far more of a, an ensemble piece and uh, the the characters of Cirilla and Yennefer uh, drove the story a lot more. And so I had to try and find a way for the audience to connect to my character in the same way that the reader would connect to the character in the books. And oh, for me, it was because we didn't have the luxury of, of long, lengthy, uh, wordy dialogue scenes with lots of uh, erudite sentences and, and philosophy. It was, I thought, okay, I, instead of making the character emotionally demanding by saying how he's feeling all the time and what his intentions are, I said, I'm gonna draw back from that and make him more of a, a cipher for the audience to try and crack because all the other characters, they, they have origin stories and, you, and they are, as I say, they're really driving the story forward. And every time Geralt came on screen, I wanted the audience to try and work out who he was. He clearly wasn't a bad guy, even though he's done some bad stuff and he has a very brusque, um, uh, stony exterior. And so I wanted to try and show that perhaps that was a stoic exterior instead of stony. And the less he would say, the more the audience would think, what is he thinking? And it became more of a performance of reactions to other characters and, and uh, listening to other characters. And then you have these few moments where you kind of get to uh, uh, get a tiny insight. And hopefully, hopefully that worked uh, for the audience to think, oh, OK, I, I, I have a connection now and I like him because I'm trying to work him out. And that for me was, was the major goal with my character. Uh, and w what about looking so unlike yourself? Um, I didn't recognize you when you first appeared as Geralt uh, uh, at all. Um, and how much of that was an aid into getting inside this? I mean, w were they y your ideas that he should have this mane of hair hanging in front of his face? Um, and uh, you look massive on the screen. You look, you know, seven foot tall and broad. <laughs> it was extraordinary. Uh, the, the wonders of, of good camera work, I think. <laughs> um, <laughs> when, it came, when it came to uh, uh, the character and how he looks, there are descriptions in the books of how he looks. Um, of course, uh, there are arguments about what some of those descriptions mean. And there are also, um, there's a very popular video game series where he has a, a very particular look. And so within pop culture, there is, there is a certain look attached to the character. And so I drew elements, uh, I, I wanted to draw on elements of all of those things and, and bring it to the show. And that really, really helped me. It was about a, an hour and a half to two hour process every morning uh, before rehearsals. And so it was, my my work period really because that was an extra two hours on top of the day and I would spend my time then really really reading and reading and reading and reading scripts uh, going over my lines for the day doing the things like working out what my character had for breakfast that kind of stuff and by the time I was in my my full Geralt rig as I call it it was it was like I was looking at a different person and I felt uh, halfway to the character just through the physicality alone. I, I would move slightly differently. And then as soon as the contact lenses went in, it became a whole different thing. My, my everything shifted and my interactions were completely different. And the only time they went back to being truly Henry was probably when I was passed out asleep in a chair in my trailer for 20 minute breaks. I admit I could have better prepared you for Yennefer. You're under a spell, aren't you? I wish I was, but no. It's a simple issue of body chemistry. You're in love with her. You, you did a lot of your own stunts, didn't you? I did. Yes, yes. For me, it was... Uh, when, when it comes to that kind of thing, like stunts, I, I've always enjoyed doing the physical stuff. And uh, working with Tom Cruise really uh, helped or... Uh, um, maybe in the eyes of producers made worse my enjoyment for uh, stunts because I, I really want to do them now and I think it's an essential piece to the character. Uh, for me, Geralt, if an audience is watching Geralt on screen 
it must be me. They must believe that it is me. And I put a lot of work into how Geralt moves. I put a lot of work into um, his, his physicality and, and each little piece, even if it's a very, very long shot of him walking down a hill somewhere, if it's not me, I feel like I've betrayed the character in some way. And, and so I, I try and do, uh, I, as much as a production will let me, I will do all the stunts for my characters if possible. And I really enjoy doing it for Geralt especially. The fights in particular, are extraordinary. The speed with which you move and the assurance <laughs> and confidence is incredible. I used to love doing stage fights. And then one day I didn't. I, I worked with an actor who, um, <laughs> I, we were, it was in a production of Coriolanus and I was playing Tullus Ophidius. And right at the beginning of the play, there's a battle scene in which comes face to face with Coriolanus. And uh, we would rehearse in a rehearsal room an hour before the show. We'd do it slowly, the whole fight, and then do it at speed. And it was always perfect. And I loved working with this actor. And everything was accurate and choreographed and brilliant and yet seeming natural. When we got on stage, I would look into his eyes and like, red mists had clouded over his eyes <laughs> and he would do anything so i mean most of the time i was going backwards because i had to because otherwise i'd walk into a sword or something and there was one <laughs> yeah. there, there was one night when um our swords met and the his sword broke and the blade went somewhere and he was left with the hilt of the sword in his hand. Now, I don't know if oh, you know this or not, but there is a tradition in stage productions when there are fights that you always put a substitute sword downstage left and downstage right, just behind just the proscenium arch to the exit. So, and the rule is every actor knows it. Your sword breaks, you step apart and do nothing. And the actor whose sword is broken will go to the nearest side of the stage, okay. pick up the sword, come back, and we will begin again. And, and the audience can accept this. Well, this particular night, this actor, his sword broke. He looked at the hilt in his hand, and then he threw it at me. <laughs> I ducked like this, and it hit a member of the audience. And there was oh, this dear. howl. From the, I mean, the person was actually hurt. Was, it was not fun. Oh, no. you know? So from that moment on, uh, stage fighting became less and less attractive to me because I was always afraid I would one day not duck fast enough. I would get me <laughs> I was a desperate old man, quixotic, paranoid, possibly senile. Let's just leave it at quixotic. And now the windmills have turned out to be giants. You want an apology? I want a squadron. Jean-Luc. Clancy. While on set, um, as much as I do love doing the sword fights, uh, when, and I, I worked with an incredible uh, stunt person by the name of Lucy Cork uh, for the episode one stunt fight, which was by far the most technical. And both of us afterwards had uh, cuts all over our knuckles. Our hands were shaking from exhaustion. It was, it, it gets to a point where, because you have to throw so much into each, each uh, piece and it has to be filled with so much aggression and you are drawing from so much adrenaline you start to get to that bit where you think i'm tired and i feel like it's getting dangerous but we only have half a day to get this so we have to shoot it i can't i can't back out now i have we, we have to do it and um it's it's a real testament to how talented she is as a stunt performer to to be able to work with her and any mistakes I made, she would adjust to and any mistakes she made, I would try and adjust to. And it becomes a real, real dance, uh, but terrifying um, towards the end of it. By the end of it, it's just, you're, you're completely adrenaline drained and you just want to stop. And uh, I, I, uh, I love doing the stunts, but when, when it's at the end that of the day, I'm very happy that they're over. The first fight in the first episode, how many, how many 
characters were you for actually fighting? Um, it seemed like a whole uh, soccer team of people. <laughs> it was just above a five-a-side soccer team. Yeah, I think I had a, a one, two, three, four, five, six in the no seven, seven in the first bit, and then just uh, the Renfrey character in the second bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I got a question for you. Okay, uh, Henry, uh, what can you tell me about the Snyder Cut? Oh, the Snyder Cut, the um, the famous slash infamous slash all sorts of things Snyder Cut. Uh, I can, I, I can't really tell you anything aside from the fact that uh, all I know is that HBO Max will be releasing it, I believe, and it'll be Zack's final vision for for the movie. And it, I don't know anything more than that. And I, I'm I'm just really happy that Zack got to realize his vision. I think it's important for a filmmaker and a storyteller to have their vision, their, their intended vision, released and shown to the world. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing it myself. Oh, great. It's That's been quite true. the ordeal sort of, uh, with, uh, Has it? with all of that. Yes. I mean, with, with Justice League when it came out and, and Zach had to depart because of a, a death in the family, and then a, a, a separate director, Joss Whedon, was brought on and there was a, a, a mix of visions and the movie wasn't well received. And then over the, the subsequent years, um, there was a, a big push by to see the, the, the fabled Snyder Cut. And uh, now that time has come. And, and I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be very enjoyable to watch uh, Zach finally release his vision, as I say. Thank you. Oh, that's great. And uh, uh, and when will we see it? Do you know? I I don't know. I don't know when they're planning to release yet. Um, I am I am just an actor, and so I I know these things. Um, not not necessarily ahead of time. <laughs> if we are lucky as actors, uh, a role comes along or an offer comes along that has an enormous impact on what follows. And that impact can go on year after year after year. Um, did that happen for you with Superman? I, I believe it did. And it's something I've always been incredibly grateful for. I've always been a fan of Superman. So just alone having the opportunity to, to literally wear his boots uh, for a number of movies and and to wear wear them not just on set either with with a character like that you you carry the mantle with you offset and it becomes it becomes part of your uh, public representation people when you meet children children don't necessarily see me as Henry Cavill um, or even Geralt of Rivia but they they might see Superman and there, there's there's a responsibility which which comes with that and it's because it's such a wonderful character, it, it's actually a responsibility I'm, I'm very happy to, to have. And I, I, hope, I hope that uh, I get to play more of Superman in years to come. Uh, my life has changed dramatically because of it. Um, it has given me plenty of opportunity for roles. And yeah, it, it was, it's been one of those characters which changed the entire course of my career. And I'm incredibly grateful for it. And it's also taught me a lot about myself. The nature of the character is, is so good. In, in what way, Henry? He, he, he's so good, the character, and he's, he's, he's so kind. And, and when, when you start to compare yourself to him because you're playing him, it, you start to really look inwards and you say, am I, am I a good person? Can I be a good enough person to play Superman? And, and, and if you ever find a, a whisper in there, which is like, hmm, hold on a second, maybe not, then you adjust it and, and you make sure you are a better person. And I think that's all we can do in life uh, when, when, as we grow and we gain experience is, is not beat ourselves for the mistakes we make, but to, to endeavor to, to be better people as, as those mistakes happen. Right. Well, there was a touch of that, certainly about um, both Jean-Luc Picard and Charles Xavier for me. Um, yes. I felt with both of them that they did have an impact 
like you have described on my private life. Um, right. In that th there was a sort of standard of m morality and behavior that you needed to uphold because uh, if you did, they would reflect badly, negatively on the, on the, um, on the character that you were playing. Um, Absolutely. I, over the years, have had so many extraordinary stories told to me by people who watched Next Generation. I, you've, you've now joined the list of them too, which is great. Um, and uh, I, I mean, ranging from uh, a, a man who, who is a police sergeant in Las Vegas, who wrote to me saying how much he enjoyed the show and how much he enjoyed being a policeman. He always wanted to be a policeman and he loved the job, but there were nights when he came home when what he had seen and heard and experienced was so awful that it almost made him despair for mankind and for the world. Mm -hmm. And when that mood took him, he would go to his VCR collection and take out a, an episode of Next Generation and put it in to be reassured that the world was going to get better. I was so touched and moved by his honesty and the way he, that he told that. So from a police sergeant in Las Vegas to people who are now important uh, people at NASA, who are involved in the actual space program because they watch Star Trek. Uh, you know, it's oh, wow. extraordinary. And, you know, one, often one, we go ahead and we do the work and we love our job and we love the, the, the experiences that it brings to us. But then hearing that you have actually impacted somebody's life is, is a, a great gift, I think. It must. It must have been. And did, did that did that factor into your decision to to play Picard again when it came to Star Trek Picard? It factored into the changes that had happened to him, because I knew what people were going to see at the very beginning of Star Trek Picard. Right. Was going to be something. Someone rather unlikable, somewhat unlikable. And I think in a way that's why the jokes became important to me. Um, yeah. uh, as well as having to communicate why he was in such bad shape, Jean-Luc, when we first met him, depressed mm. and anxious and guilt-ridden, you know. Um, but. Uh, my wife is a singer, a musician, singer, songwriter, and I don't think saw a lot of theater when she was young, although she was trained classically as an opera singer. Mm -hmm. But she has been the first person in my life who actually has commented occasionally negatively on how I bring a character home with me. Oh, okay. That right. something you have, the absorption has been so real and so intense. And just sitting in the back of a car being driven home is, it, it is not sufficient to free yourself of all of that. And I now have to consciously think about it. I, I am this woman's husband. You know, I'm not <laughs> crazy Jean Luc Picard or Charles Xavier. <laughs> And, and, and that is the most important role that I have to play. So come on, Patrick, get yeah. ready for it. <laughs> get ready for going home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what it, do you have? Do you have any personal uh, work ambitions? I don't mean particular projects, but is there a direction you would like to go in? I mean, do you think you might at some point do more theatre work or? I, I do, I do love the idea of doing theatre work. I, when I was very young, it's it's how my first experience of acting was was theatre. I was um, yes. 
in in the school plays from the age of I want to say ten. So I, I I do love that feeling of walking out on stage. That sense of is that that mild panic, which is replaced by by elation when when it all begins, and I love it. But I also love TV and film, and I I think for now for now I'd like to remain in TV and film. I, I'd like to get into producing and maybe even one day directing and in the future perhaps uh when i'm ready to embarrass myself and it won't matter when i do i might try going back to the stage <laughs> i just as you were talking just now i suddenly had the the image of me walking into a room to audition for you <laughs> I, I i think i might see if I can't get that, if, if artificially set up, that it would be actually quite good. Sir Patrick, uh, as, as you were saying, um, that maybe, maybe one day you, you had this image of you one day auditioning for me, I, 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 I think it would be wonderful and I will definitely have it arranged, but only if Sir Ian McKellen is walking in as you are walking out. So you get to cross <laughs> each other's paths and then wonder. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if a Sir Ian is walking out, I could hear uh, you or one of your colleagues say, oh, thank God he's gone. Fine. That's good. Now, now, what have we got coming in the door? <laughs> you know, this guy's going to nail you know, <laughs> Ian is... A dear, dear friend, I, and I love him. I am actually in love with him. Um, and we, in the past few years, have done so much work together. I was hugely intimidated by him. We both worked for the Royal Shakespeare Company together, but um, and and he was a star of the company, and I was still making my way up. And I never had a conversation with him because I was too terrified of making a fool of myself. Now, uh, you know, we are, you know, I love being embraced by him and kissed by him. It just feels so fantastic. Um, <laughs> but, but we too are, are looking, you know, we, we're, we're hoping to try and find something else. There are not many uh, possibilities where you would have two characters that, that we could each lose ourselves in and connect with again, but I hope it happens. Speaking, speaking of the, uh, the, the Shakespearean connection, uh, we have a lot of actors on our show who have um, experience with theatre and Shakespeare, and Anya Shalotra, um, who is playing Yennefer, who is probably one of the best actors I've ever worked with, and Joey Beatty, who plays uh, Yaskia, who's a wonderful foil to Geralt. He has a lot of um, Shakespeare experience. But I've noticed you are doing um, sonnets, daily sonnets, on your Instagram. What has inspired that? And and I often pop in there and look at them, and, and you have your, your favorite one, or you have friends reading them. And um, where does that inspiration come from? Well, um, once again, I have to say it came from my wife. One Saturday night, a couple of months ago, we were sharing a bottle of wine and into my head there floated the first lines of sonnet 116 let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments and uh, so i said a couple of lines and sonny said what what is that i said oh it's a it's a shakespeare sonnet she said well go on do, do, do some more of it I, it's a sonnet i know by heart so i did and when I finished, she said, I want you to do it again and I'm going to film it. I, I, want, to have, I want to have a record of this. Oh, yeah. Lord. So I did it again. And, and then she said, I think we should post this. Just put it out there on social media. And I said, it's a sonnet. Nobody's going to care about a sonnet. You know, okay, this is a well-known one, but you know, right? Eh. Anyway, we did. The response was overwhelming uh, mm -hmm. from 
so many people who said oh, how lovely it was to listen to those words and to hear that feeling behind them. So we talked about it and I said, look, we're in shutdown. Shutdown was just starting. Um, when I was little, my, when my mother would cut up fruit for me, she used to say, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. And I yeah. said, what, what if we were to say, a sonnet a day keeps the doctor away? Now, I do not mean to be disre disrespectful to those poor people who have caught the coronavirus. But that's what we decided we would call it. So I'm doing one song today, but we've taken a break because um, what has happened in Minneapolis and what has been happening in other places is so sad and enraging and infuriating. <clears throat> I felt I just couldn't deal with sonnets. Not at this present time. They were they were mm -hmm. not appropriate. So we've just called a temporary halt to that. But any day now, we we are going to go back to it. I think uh, Instagram is is such a, a wonderful way. It's such, it can be used as such a tool for good and and for positive thought. And uh, it's it's incredible. I used to fear it so much. I resisted social media for for years and years and years where my my agents or uh, publicists were saying you have to get onto social media and i said no I, that's not who i am I, I don't want to put myself on the internet i'm out there enough already as it is and i it took me a while to realize but it can be used as such a wonderful tool for positivity good great messaging and i i i love it for that and i, I think your sonnets are absolutely wonderful well, and of the societal good that it can do, there is no better example than that 17-year-old girl who filmed what happened in Minneapolis to George, being his neck being knelt on. The, the courage of that girl to stand so close to that scene and to show the world what was going on was extraordinary. Maybe the most remarkable thing that I've ever experienced, you know, on social media. Well, uh, look, I, I want to make a deal with you, um, Henry, that uh, uh -oh. next time we say hello, hello, it will be face to face. Uh, oh, I'm please. pretty much going to be, even when we go, by the way, this morning, the LA Times said that tomorrow, Friday, there are going to be certain relaxing of the of the lockdown conditions and it actually mentioned that film television and music was included in that i mean you know uh, production yeah, yeah. absolutely so that's fantastic uh, we, we, are, is, we are still quite strict over here the article. i'm sorry say that again we're still quite strict over here we're, we're things are starting to relax a little bit but it's, uh, we're still reasonably strict. Oh, well, here too, you know, we're both in countries where it is still very, very unsafe. And, um, uh, but I, you know, if it's in the LA Times, it's gotta be true. Absolutely. I mean, it's always true, right? When Next Generation was announced, when there was, they were gonna revive Star Trek, the Los Angeles Times, in the article, the first article they wrote about this, said, and the captain of the Enterprise will be played by unknown British Shakespearean actor, Patrick Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> and um, a, a few weeks after we'd started filming, one day I arrived at Paramount and there was a notice stuck to the door of my trailer and in big red letters, it said, warning, unknown British Shakespearean actors. <laughs> Brent Spiner, uh, my dear friend, had, had, had got this thing set up and uh, somebody tried to sell it at an auction a couple of years ago. And I was able to step in and say, that's a fake because I have the original at home. You have the original. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, just, Henry, just before we go, it's been great, great talking to you. 
it's, sorry, can I just ask one more question? So I'm, I'm really, really oh, interested yeah, sure. in um, a, a, on Brent Spiner and data and data's eulogy. Uh, you said such stuff, uh, it was such stuff as dreams were made on was one of the lines. And was that your influence that put that into the eulogy? From no, the Tempest? I, I, I never proposed those Shakespeare references ever. They always came from the writer's room because okay. <clears throat> I didn't, I didn't want it to seem that in the middle of this science fiction, I was pushing my own acting history, which right. for so many years was with Shakespeare. Um, yeah. But we all loved doing it. We did do, we, I think we did a scene from Henry V, or maybe it was, oh no, it was Hamlet. Uh, data was Hamlet, and I was one of the grave diggers, if I, if I remember, in disguise. Oh, well, it's, it's been wonderful talking to you and thank you so much for your wonderful stories and, and all the insight into every, all the work you did in that character and for the years you've done. And uh, as you say, next time, I would absolutely love to be talking face to face. It's a deal. You got it.